Your geography teacher must have told you there are seven continents in the world. In 2017, scientists made an announcement that changed this universal truth, the discovery of Zealandia. They called for a change in world maps and provided us with some proof, of course. First off, let's take a look at the ocean floor near New Zealand. The continental shelves of this mysterious continent are chilling at a depth of around 3,280 feet below sea level. The nearby oceanic crust dives even deeper at 9,800 feet below that. All of that is giving us those continent vibes, with varying altitudes from deep below the ocean to the majestic Mount Cook, standing tall at 12,217 feet above sea level. Brave geologists have gone deep down to collect rocks from the ocean floor. They found that unlike the nearby oceanic crust, which is made up of fresh basaltic rocks, the crust around New Zealand is one impressive mix. We're talking granite, limestone, sandstone, and some ancient rock types that are incredibly ancient. All this screams continental crust. Finally, scientists have discovered a narrow strip of oceanic crust that separates Australia from the hidden land of Zealandia. It means these two are separate continents. 85 million years ago, Zealandia decided to break free from the supercontinent Gondwana. Millions of years later, the Earth's tectonic plates, those puzzle pieces that make up our planet's crust, started throwing a wild party. The mighty Pacific Plate, the heavyweight champion of tectonic plates, decided to take a dive beneath Zealandia's continental crust. This process is called subduction. As a result, the root of Zealandia, that connection to its continental crust, broke off and went into the depths below. So you see now that it takes millions of years and a lot of action for a new continent to form. But what if the impossible happened? and a new continent formed overnight in the Pacific Ocean. The next morning, you'd probably spill your morning coffee while watching the news. For this newfound land to be considered a full-fledged continent, it needs to have a surface area like Zealandia and be a large, uninterrupted chunk of land with some water surrounding it. And here comes the twist. The Pacific Ocean has an average depth of 13,000 feet. So, if a continent wanted to join the party, it would have to push a whole lot of rock upward, shaping its way to the surface. A new continent emerging overnight would make sea levels skyrocket. We'd have to say goodbye to geographically low-lying countries like Bangladesh, Senegal, and the Netherlands. The ocean currents would be in for a wild ride too. The North Pacific subtropical gyre, a vibrant hotspot for marine life, would be thrown off balance. Those poor marine creatures who rely on the currents for their journeys would need some new source of navigation. Plus, the creatures that live permanently in one place could lose their main food source. Oceans are like global free-for-alls, but with a new continent in play, the countries situated nearby would be willing to stake their claim on this unexpected landmass. This new continent would be a blank canvas no lush landscapes or freshwater sources, just rock and more rock. So if you are dreaming of relocating to this novelty, you have to wait for some serious terraforming to make it habitable. But for now, let's go back to the real new continent of Zealandia. It's actually a microcontinent, which is an official word for a landmass that has separated from a main continent. In our case, it was Antarctica and then Australia. You could say Zealandia is a bit shy, with only up to 7% of its size peaking above the water surface. But it's nearly 70% as large as Australia in total and proudly boasts of two major islands we know and love as New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island. Plus, there are many smaller islets. The largest islands have glaciers, like the famous Tasman Glacier on the South Island. Thanks to some glacial action in the past, Zealandia can show off its fjords and valleys. New Caledonia has a tropical vibe with its Oceania and South Pacific connections. The unofficial eighth continent is a hotspot for geological action. Part of it belongs to the Australian plate, while the rest rides the Pacific plate. It has six major areas with active volcanoes. And don't forget the geothermal treats, 
geysers, and hot springs are scattered all over the place, courtesy of the Australian and Pacific plates having a steamy interaction. The underwater world of Zealandia is a treasure chest of mineral deposits and natural gas fields. It's also a scientific playground. During those icy glacial periods, sea levels dropped and more of Zealandia emerged from the depths. The fossils this process left behind are like an encyclopedia of valuable clues about the life that thrived here during ancient times. The search for Zealandia lasted for 375 years. It all started in 1642, when Dutch seafarer and explorer Abel Tasman set on a mission from Jakarta, Indonesia. Back in the day, Europeans were sure that there had to be a massive land down under to balance out their own continent up north. They even had a fancy name for it, Terra Australis. Tasman was determined to become the first to find it. He went west, then south, then east, all the way to the South Island of New Zealand. But here's where things took a turn for the worst. The local Maori people, who had been living there for centuries, didn't exactly roll out the red carpet. They rammed one of Tasman's small boats, and sadly, four of the Europeans met their ends. What happened next remains a mystery. But a few weeks later, Tasman sailed back home without ever stepping foot on this mysterious land he believed to be the great southern continent. He never came back. The explorer didn't even realize that he was actually right all along about the existence of a missing continent. And you already know it only became official in 2017. Another lost and found continent isn't hiding in the ocean, but under Europe. It's called the Greater Adria, and it collided with Europe and started to sink under it around 140 million years ago. Today, it lies beneath Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Its size and even shape match that of Greenland, the world's largest island. Greater Adria is no longer visible, but it left some clues. Parts of it were embedded in the Alps, other chucks were incorporated into present-day Italy and Croatia on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. Limestone rocks from the former continent started to change once they were under the European landmass. Tremendous heat and pressure spread over tens of millions of years changed their structure. Out goes the limestone, in comes the marble. All the Greek and Roman temples you admired on your summer vacation were constructed using this marble. It was sort of a going-away gift from a long-lost continent. You don't notice this, but our planet never stops moving, and it happens deep beneath our feet. 120 million years ago, Australia and Antarctica were a single piece of land. They went their separate ways, but Antarctica didn't leave empty-handed. Today, there is an oceanic plateau in the Indian Ocean. Long ago, it was connected to another lost continent, the Kerguelen microcontinent. Scientists believe that it made a land bridge between India and Antarctica. To find out what it was like, we can look at a tiny archipelago in the southern Indian Ocean. These islands are all that is left of the ancient landmass. They have a cold climate and feature glaciers because they're so close to Antarctica. But in the past, the climate must have been temperate with plenty of rainfall. The animals and plants would have been similar to those that we find in tropical regions today. The lost continent landscape was probably much like that of New Zealand. Our planet keeps changing, and at some point, all the continents will reconnect with each other, forming one supercontinent again. And maybe then, future humans will wonder, what if our continent broke into pieces tomorrow? Scientists claim that Icelandia was a region between Greenland and Scandinavia that was more than 230,000 square miles, but is now underwater. The Earth was once a large pizza pie, with all the continents connected to each other millions of years ago, otherwise known as Pangaea. The North Atlantic region we know today was dry land from about 335 million to 175 million years ago. For many years, scientists and geologists assumed that the North Atlantic Ocean was birthed as Pangaea began to split apart roughly 200 million years ago. With volcanoes in the region where Iceland is, the country came to be just 60 million years ago as it broke off and sailed away from all the other lands. 
And since the earth was like a large pizza pie, it divided like one. Many of the lands split up into many large and small pieces, creating the continents we know today. But this new theory suggests that the result of Pangaea's splitting left out some land that stretched for around 200 miles. And just about 10 million years ago, that piece of land submerged in the waters on the eastern and western side, leaving the tip of the land, which is now Iceland. When plate tectonics move, they grind on each other, which gave shape to our current landscape, all thanks to the mantle. This new radical theory goes against everything written in history books and what scientists have been studying. They began shaking heads, drawing lots of skepticism and criticism. But by analyzing the ocean floor under Iceland and the Earth's crust, we can assume that this idea isn't far-fetched. The crust beneath Iceland happens to be a lot thicker than the typical ones. Oceanic crust is made up of unique melted rocks compared to the land crusts where we walk and live on, and is a lot more denser. The thinnest layer on Earth is the crust, where life takes place. It's essential for water, growing food, gathering natural resources and minerals, and breathing in oxygen. It sinks below to the bottom, but right above the Earth's mantle. It also refreshes itself, since it constantly gets recycled into the mantle and back up. This is why the rocks in the oceanic crust are around 25 miles thick, compared to just 5 miles anywhere else. This is also reasonable given that it's in a hot spot for volcanoes. Magnetic surveys of the ocean floor show layers of molten crust in stripe patterns. Also given the fact that the Earth's magnetic field changed its polarity over millions of years, it played a role in shaping the foundation of our landscape. But there isn't any hmm. concrete evidence to prove this new theory just yet. One of the first steps is to start digging the ocean floor near Iceland. Zircon is a very sturdy mineral that can last for billions of years despite erosion in the Earth's crust. By taking samples and studying them, researchers can estimate the geological age of the continents. This will make sure the crust is oceanic, which is thicker, or continental, which is the regular crust we walk on. This isn't an overnight project and would come with a hefty cost. Another way is to do seismic surveys that can measure echoes conducted on research ships. Drilling holes miles deep in the crust can also help with the research. But this would cost more than studying the zircon minerals. Some fossilized plants unique to both Scandinavia and Greenland might prove that Icelandia was once on the surface and possibly scattered with trees. It wasn't a cold land as it is today, so it may have had forests. But scientists still haven't found fossil evidence of animals common in both lands to suggest anything. But maybe time will tell. The theory goes deeper, which suggests that there was a greater Icelandia. With Iceland, Ireland, Britain, Scandinavia, and Greenland all in one microcontinent, it could be a destination of winter enthusiasts and great for skiing. It could be possible to connect Canada to Greater Icelandia by train over the ocean, which would open up the economy even more. Iceland is around 40,000 square miles, which is already quite big. And if the Greater Icelandia was present today, then Europe would be a completely different continent. Many theories are circulating about other possible hidden microcontinents around the world. Scientists aren't certain of the possibility of Icelandia's existence. But if all the studies conducted were done correctly, then the theory could change everything we know about Iceland and the North Atlantic Ocean. And this could pave the way for other sunken microcontinents around the world. Another theory out there is that New Zealand was the tip of a lost subcontinent, even bigger than Icelandia, called Zealandia. Studies show that it's separated from the supercontinent Gondwana between 79 to 83 million years ago. Scientists claim that it's the thinnest and youngest continent discovered underwater. Creighton is a core rock that acts as the main foundation for most continents. It's at least a billion years old, but the continental crust that makes up Zealandia 
is just half of that, which makes it quite young. That means some craton is missing, even though it holds some leftovers of older rocks and parts of the mantle. They're estimated to be as old as 2.7 billion years old. Scientists did some studies on the zircon crystals from New Zealand and found out that they're as old as 1.3 billion years old. The rest of the continents are more than 3 billion years old. Scientists studied the composition of the rocks in the bottom of the ocean around New Zealand. They're made up of silica and granite, which are found in continental crusts. The ocean floors mainly have magnesium and iron-rich rocks. They're also thicker and higher than regular ocean crusts around it. They conducted some studies and collected magnetic and topographic data to see the link between the Tasman and Coral Seas in the Cato Trough region. This is the narrow strip between Zealandia and Australia. Satellite data tracked tiny faults in the Earth's gravity to map out the crust of the ocean floor surrounding the area. They saw the mass that makes up Zealandia quite visible and almost the size of Australia. Even though the signs are there, this doesn't prove anything. It's possible that there are a bunch of microcontinents which all split apart when Australia broke free of Gondwana. Back then, the supercontinent was made up of South America, Antarctica, Australia, Zealandia, Arabia, and the Indian subcontinent. New Zealand is already not the biggest country out there, but if the theories are correct, then Zealandia will be six times its original size. Mauritius is a young island that's only a few million years old. Just 1,200 miles off the coast of Africa, it's believed that the tiny island came to life around 9 million years ago. The underwater volcanoes in the region spewed out so much lava that it formed the land today. But scientists found zircon rocks that are more than 3 billion years old. It may also be part of a continent submerged underwater called Mauritia, which is just a quarter of the size of Madagascar. The zircons they found were embedded in solid rocks and not just in the sand, which may rule out that they just washed up on shore from another continent. Some scientists are still not convinced. They suggest that discovering rocks that stand out from the other typical ones brought by an eruption could skew the scientific community to this theory. But just like how Icelandia could be part of Greater Icelandia, Mauritia was once called Rodinia, which consisted of India and Madagascar. Theories suggest that Mauritia was covered in water when India broke away from Madagascar, something like 85 million years ago. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality, but until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. 
According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there. But scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Thot. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, but Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. 
the latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Muvul Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the giant crystal cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. 
A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super-tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now, who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Ruzo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. But thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. Legend has it that in the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton noticed an apple fall from a tree and began wondering why the fruit had fallen to the ground and not upward or sideways. 
Well, that would be freaky. After years of studying, he concluded that gravity must be the culprit. The scientists called it a force of attraction that existed between all objects. But it was Albert Einstein, many years later, that revolutionized these ideas about gravity. Legend also has it that he wasn't completely satisfied with Newton's findings. Something just didn't seem right. As a young scientist, Einstein had some trouble formulating his theories, trying to explain the behavior of moving objects. When an experiment came to his mind, he called it the happiest of thoughts. Gravity feels like the sensation of riding in an ascending elevator. He called it general relativity. Einstein began working tirelessly, trying to prove this idea. At one point, he even complained he was on the brink of losing his mind. Now, in the simplest terms, general relativity claims that gravity is the curvature or warping of space. The greater mass an object has, the more it warps the space around it. Imagine a heavy ball resting on a trampoline. The rubber sheet under it gets warped under its weight. It's the same with our sun. It's big enough to twist space across the entire solar system. That's why our planet, as well as all the others, orbit around the star. This warping also impacts how we measure time. If you look at your watch, time seems to go by at the same rate every day. But if you hike to the top of a mountain and your friend wanders through a valley at the bottom of this mountain, you'll see that your watches will calculate time differently. One watch will tick faster, while the hands of the second one, which is traveling through the valley, will move more slowly. That's because gravity affects how fast time goes by. With these experiments in mind, Einstein concluded that gravity was not a force of attraction, but rather a curvature in the fabric of space-time. We feel gravity as a force simply because we're placed on some surface. If there was no surface and no attraction between us and this surface, we would become weightless. If you don't mind getting some weird looks, try this experiment. You'll need a bathroom scale and an elevator to ride. You'll soon see that your weight fluctuates as you move up and down in the building in the elevator. The gravitational force is the same, but your weight is different because the elevator speeds up and slows down. Aboard the International Space Station, astronauts literally move along with the station, so there's nothing to push them against the side of the station so that they have some weight. Even if we still think of gravity as a force, it's the weakest one we know. First of all, it only attracts. There's no negative counterpart that could push things away. And weirdly, even though this force is strong enough to keep galaxies together, we still overcome it every day. Every time you lift an object off the floor, you overcome the force of gravity produced by the entire Earth. Ooh! Just to paint a better picture, Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than the power of a refrigerator magnet. The fact that our planet has gravity also affects the way we look and act. All creatures on Earth are limited in growth by the height of their skeleton and by how much weight it can carry, which is directly proportional to gravity. That's why some marine creatures can grow bigger. The largest animal on our planet right now is the Antarctic blue whale. It's about the size of two school buses combined. That's because sea creatures can float, which slightly counteracts gravity. The effects of gravity can be seen in people, too. We are taller in the morning than we are in the evening. Our everyday activities and the added effect of gravity make the cartilage in our ankles, knees, hips, back, and neck compress. Once you have overnight rest, the cartilage swells back to normal. Gravity might also affect your shower routine. That is, if you're an astronaut. They have to rely on the old-fashioned way of bathing up there on the space station. They can't take a shower since the force of gravity up there is different and water doesn't flow as it should. Instead, they use liquid soap, water, and no-rinse shampoo. They first squeeze some liquid soap and water from pre-made water pouches onto their skin. Next, they open the no-rinse shampoo and add a little water to wash their hair. Towels are then used to wipe off the excess water, which is really precious in space. To make sure they recycle it, an airflow system quickly evaporates excess water. Gravity and weight shouldn't be confused. Astronauts on the space station do float, and you may sometimes hear that they are in the state of zero gravity. 
It's far from the truth, though, since gravity up there is about 90% of its value on our planet. But astronauts look and feel weightless since weight is the force a certain object exerts on them back on Earth. Most creatures have evolved to sense and adapt to Earth's gravitational pull. In the sea, for instance, some fish have floating calcium carbonate deposits in their heads. Scientists call them ear stones, and they're pulled down by gravity. They act like a fish's internal compass. Now, plants have evolved to grow starch grains in the tips of their roots. They use this amazing feature to force their roots deep down into the soil. As little as we seem to understand it these days, we do need gravity for way more things than we can imagine. For instance, some bacteria become even more dangerous in space where there's little to no gravity. Salmonella, for example, the type of bacteria that is known to cause food poisoning, becomes three times nastier in the condition of microgravity. So you really gotta cook your chicken. Our own moon stays where it is because of the effects of gravity, too. If it weren't for this force, our satellite would have floated away by now. But it's held in place by Earth's gravitational pull. Objects with the biggest gravitational pulls in the universe are black holes. Thankfully, our planet is really far away from any of them. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, not even light itself. Similarly, gravity is different on each planet. And because of that, things weigh differently depending on which planet they're on. Take Earth, for example. An object that weighs 100 pounds here would only be 38 pounds on Mercury. But if you're planning on losing weight fast, try booking a trip to Pluto. Someone who weighs 150 pounds on Earth would weigh no more than 10 pounds on Pluto. The same person would weigh considerably more on Jupiter, which is the planet with the most powerful gravity. 150 pounds on Earth would turn into more than 354 pounds there. Mm, no thanks. Remember that experiment with watches ticking at different levels of elevation? It turns out that gravity isn't spread evenly on the surface of Earth. Why? Because our planet isn't a perfect sphere. The mass of Earth isn't evenly distributed either. That's why you get variations in gravity in different locations. More so, gravity is weaker at the equator because of the centrifugal forces produced by the planet's rotation. Since we've always perceived gravity as a force, we seem to believe that it has somewhat of a suction motion. But it's not exactly true. Back in 1998, scientists were baffled to see that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. So they linked this to the repulsive gravity of mysterious dark energy. We now know that dark energy makes up for more than 60% of the mass energy of our whole universe. But since nobody knows what it actually is, we can only make assumptions. And one that's largely accepted is quantum theory, which seems to claim that gravity pushes rather than pulls things in. You got all that? I may need to watch this one again. The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle. And then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought. Because now, scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon. And made of nickel and solid iron, it's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. 
they found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shockwaves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot. The island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles? They affect, they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. 
No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the land mass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds.